fictional. Fictional. Yeah, that, that makes sense. You're really not crossing the streams there. <laughs> Alright, come on you, give me a question, it's worth answering. Mark, is there anything you look for in a role... No! <laughs> in particular, that you... No! <laughs> that makes you want to accept or... No! <laughs> no. Is there anything I look for in particular? Or that is it interesting? No. Is it exciting? Say no to a role. I've said no to many roles. <laughs> I'm saying no to you now. Yeah. Be nice. This isn't Misha's panel. <laughs> wakey, wakey. I haven't had my breakfast yet. That's what you get for waking up in Vegas. <laughs> Hi, Mark. Hey. Um, so, a friend of mine told me that you love the Beatles. Oh. <laughs> what is your favorite Beatles song, good sir? <laughs> a friend of yours, another friend of yours wouldn't have, like, scruffy hair. Yay high. Scruffy beard. Yeah, yay high, you said? Oh, that's so sweet. <laughs> you just made him five feet tall. <laughs> I'm sure he'll enjoy that. It's just, uh, payback is going to be interesting. I heard about this, but I haven't fully heard the extent of what he said. What did he really say? He said that you fucking hate them. No! <laughs> <laughs> but I what? Do I love Ringo? No, not really. I mean, if I have to explain my position on the Beatles, it's really simple. It's like, um, they're really important in music. I love John Lennon, don't get me wrong. John Lennon is a great <laughs> This year. But I, but I really, I don't think there's ever been a Beatles song that somebody else hasn't covered better. Really? Scrambled eggs, how I love those scrambled eggs. I'm like, not a big fan. Let's put it this way. Uh, everybody under the age of 18, put your fingers in your ears. Ready? Go. Uh, there's certain things you can do to Marvin Gaye that you can't do to the Beatles. <laughs> I listen to music because I either want to do that or fight or something similar. Uh, the Beatles is like, listen to me, like listening to James Taylor. It's like... <laughs> cleverly crafted, wonderful, brilliantly clever stuff that people like Jimi Hendrix and Stevie Wonder and Joe Cocker and other people took their stuff and made it so much better. <laughs> I'm sorry, do you want to hear Ringo singing? What would you do if I sang out a two? Would you stand up and... <laughs> <laughs> There's a great story about, about McCartney going to see Jimi Hendrix play in London on the Saturday after the Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band had come out on Thursday, and Hendrix was playing with Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band in the States. It was really good. There you go, troublemaker, go sit down. <laughs> Next, I'm going to pay Curtis back for this big time. <laughs> um, well, well um, I was just wondering, as a musician, what other bands or musicians inspired you to? What a great voice. Thanks, I grew myself. <laughs> I don't think you did. I think your parents would probably beg to differ, disagree with that one. A little bit, maybe. A little bit, maybe. What was the question? What musicians or artists inspired you to be a better musician than an artist? Is this one I'm going to have to sit down for as well? I don't know. <laughs> probably adoration and love. It's pretty cool being a drummer in a band. It's pretty cool being an actor. It's pretty cool doing that. Yeah. I did it for the nookie. It's the telling of stories. Be honest with you, it's the telling of stories. Telling stories is fun. Ask Curtis. <laughs> That's what he does for a living. That man is an excellent teller of stories. Some of them are true, some of them are not. 
Um, but that's what it is. Telling stories makes a difference. Music, paintings, sculptures, all telling stories. I had this weird conversation with Max um, and, and Sarah the other night about and trying to find out why, you know when people say, I like this or I don't like that, right? It's this whole sort of, well, that's just a matter of taste, and that's just this, and you know, well, you're entitled to your opinion. I hate that phrase. Hey, yeah. They should. Um, and it, it sort of worries me that, that, that things get dismissed as taste. I think there is a sort of universal law of, of, of sort of excellence in any form of art. That you can look at things you don't particularly like, me in particular, and still see the value of it, and see how excellent something is. That in its genre and in, in, its, in its place, it's a fantastic execution of something. And I think a lot of it comes down to how much passion has actually gone into it. How much effort, energy, and passion is going into it. I know we have something called the uncanny valley. I mean, we deal a lot with digital, digital domain nowadays. All of us are dealing and seeing digital. And they want to build human beings and put them on screens, very Max Hedron-like, and uh, so that they don't actually have to deal with us at all. They can make, them, make them, these models do whatever uh, in our place. And there's, there's this, this phenomenon called the uncanny valley that a human being can discern that that is not a human being. You can see that the digital rendering is not a human being. It's a very uncomfortable thing. We're built that way, biologically wired that way, so that we don't pick things other than human beings to mate with. It's, basically, it's pretty much part of the biology of it. Um, it's a protection mechanism. So there's a real difficulty in creating human beings that aren't human beings in that way. And I think the opposite effect of that is that we sense things that are not organic. And I think our art and our appreciation of music and all of these things is not just a matter of taste. There's a certain core element of things that sings to us or, or speaks to us that is really simple. And it's not just the way you relate to it. That's why you can become more fanatical about it, to use the true sense of fanatic. Um, but it's not just like, oh, I, I love all aspects of Supernatural. It's like there are things about it that are really good. But you can look at TV shows that you don't like, and, and there are some that you go, well, it's still brilliant, it's just not something I enjoy. But why do we look at, at Van Gogh and usually universally um, go, it's kind of amazing that somebody can actually create this sort of statue. You can't argue about the statue of David. It's just like, it's not an argument you can have. It is what it is. It'll never not be what it, not be something that's an incredible human achievement. It's, it's, it's beyond our comprehension and our ability to understand it. Now, what's funny is when you get to the Beatles and stuff like that, you, you, you have to validate that of their, that of their era and of their ilk, what they created, a lot of what they created, has had a profound effect on us for those reasons. Is that there's something in there that makes it excellent. And what I think is really bad is there is so much TV and so many films and so much music that does absolutely nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. It was funny to watch the, the, you know, the Pharrell court case where everybody's freaking out in the music industry. Because it's not that similar. It's not like a straight steel. George Harrison had it with My Sweet Lord and uh, She's So Fine, which was the, one of the most famous plagiarism court cases, and it was to do with how many notes were the same and the feel of it. And, and you're talking about now we've done everything in music, and now we've produced everything in music, how the hell do you pin it? Is it a straight lift? Is it not a straight lift? And what's really funny is, I don't care for the Robin Thicke thick song at all. I'll put Marvin on any day of the week. And it's not because, it's not because I'm an elitist, or it's because, well, Marvin Gaye's cooler. It's just there's something about that song in its time and its place that is so fantastic. Um, and then to bring it back to what we're all here for, which is talking about supernatural or whatever. Um, there are, I know for a fact, because I've worked on other shows, that there is a level of excellence on the show that I currently work on, which is not the same as every other show that's made. I know that from working on, you know, Doctor Who, there is a level of excellence on Doctor Who. Show who... I mean, Firefly, Battlestar, all of these shows that were done that I was lucky enough to participate in. Um, you're talking about the endeavors of hundreds of people who are putting their whole hearts into a situation. Everything they've got, everything they care about. And, that, and it's infectious, and it's truly infectious. They make these products for us, and we watch these products. And there is, a, I think, a biological reaction to it, is that it's done with passion. And if you can, if you can latch onto it, if you're just open enough to see the beauty in it, as, as 
preface to which of Dorian Gray, uh, Oscar Wilde wrote, you know, any person that thinks, is any person who can't see the beauty in art is a Philistine or something. Um, if you stay open to it, you can find things that are fantastic and beautiful in almost anything. Stand still long enough and open your heart. That's what the trick is. So there. So that's enough about Curtis' bloody old struggle.